Hello and welcome to Quadcast, Quadrant Chambers weekly discussion forum, looking at news, hot topics and legal developments in the world of commercial litigation. We have four barristers from London, that is me, Paul Downs, Poonam Marwani, Joe Sullivan and Claudia Wilmot-Smith, and we gather uh, every Thursday, 5pm on YouTube live to talk about a topic. This week we're going to look at bankers' duties. And we are, as usual, completely divided about our views on this topic. But before we do that, let's do some catch up. Uh, who should we start with, Joe? What's your news? Good football. Uh, it's been a good week for football, hasn't it? Well, yeah, actually, for, uh, happily, Liverpool did in fact win last night. As you may <laughs> no, I meant before that. Yeah, no, I can't remember what happened before that, but um, they won 2 0 last night. Um, though this week I have been, I bought my daughter some Heelys. You know, do you know what they are? Heelys? What? Heelys. No. They're shoes that have got wheels in the heel. inside oh, yeah. the heels. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. They are lethal. <laughs> I mean, I'd never see it. I thought like riding a bike was bad or scooter. No, this is like something else. Uh, well, I've got some myself. Well, you can get adult ones, <laughs> uh, I, I saw, from the <laughs> website, um, which I haven't done for myself yet, but maybe there's... Yeah, well, you, I'll get you some for Christmas. And Joe, she's back at school, presumably. You can. Got some piece this week. Yeah, back full time at school, seeing all the friends, so that's, that's great. Um, and it just has to continue with no one getting COVID in the class. Um, so, <laughs> fingers crossed. What have you been up to, Poonam? Uh, well, on the topic of COVID, it was a very exciting week for me because I had my vaccine on Tuesday. But can I just tell you all, right, because it's the cohort is, what, 55 to 59, and I am not yet 55. <laughs> I'm still younger than that before anyone starts aging me. But um, the local medical centre had lots left over and not enough people coming in, and they rang me on Tuesday and said, would you like to come and have it today? And I went, woo, and I ran. And actually... This is what I'm now feeling I'm going to be doing, guys. There. <laughs> no, we're not dancing, Ben. You took it off and kept the music going. But yeah, I can't wait. Um, and uh, yes, and, that, and it is very exciting news, and I feel very privileged to have had it. Claudia, how are you happy since um, restrictions came up a little bit on the 8th, right? Yeah, I mean, now I'm massively jealous of your vaccine thing. So my happiness is just taking a nose dog, so I'm not there yet. But yeah, I mean, kids are back at school, so my godson's back. And um, well, I had my first takeaway coffee for God knows how long. I've been outside every day this week. Um, so I've definitely been enjoying a lightening of restrictions. Um, and long may this trend continue. Absolutely. Well, I, that reminds me of uh, you have a lot in common then with Meghan Markle, don't you? Uh, I have no inside. idea. I know sufficiently little about Meghan Markle that I could not answer that question. I watched um, it. It's the big news. And I'm not going to say anything about it because I'll probably find myself the subject of various complaints to, I don't know. Off apparently you'll reveal band. which generation you belong to. Apparently uh, responses to yeah, this generation line. So can we tell how old or young you are? by? Uh... I'm young. But right. anyway, apart from that, I did think I've got. I can say this. I don't think it's that. Kind. I thought Megan. the palace response was fantastic. I thought sixty-nine words. Whether you agree with them or not, I oh, thought yeah. what an absolute model of brevity, concision, tone. Goodness me! I thought that was it great. Would be good. I have if judgments. If judgments could be so concise, wouldn't it? Um, You're fading yeah, what, a bit. Sorry. You're fading a bit, Poonam. I don't know. Okay, Paul, I never fade. Okay, again, <laughs> we're going back to age. But all right, um, I'll see what I can Sound-wise, I mean. Okay, I was saying that wouldn't it be good if judgments could be more concise? I've been reading longer and longer judgments all the time, and they're driving me potty. But uh, They definitely are on the upward trend, aren't they? Um, okay, well, look, uh, this week... Uh, we are looking at uh, this case that's out, uh, first instance decision of his honour Judge Rusin, Philip and Barclays Bank. Interesting case, quite controversial, certainly amongst the four of us. But we're going to start by looking at uh, the, 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 this general quince care duty 
And Joe, you're going to tell us what the duty is and you're going to tell us a little bit about this, this case. Is that right? Well, just in very headline terms, the duty, and I try to express this as <laughs> incontroversially as possible. Um, <laughs> no, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. A, I'm getting ready. It's a you might be able to start from a laughter that we do not agree. That is imposed on a bank. If the bank is put on inquiry that a payment instruction has been given in circumstances that are indicative of of fraud. Um, right. Well, I'm not sure. Well, we'll see about that. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Claudia, take over from me, please. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. I've got it here. Got okay, it well, Quince Care, you can tell this is an old case because it's about checks, right? So a bank agreed to lend £400,000 to a company to purchase chemist shops, the company chairman caused about 340,000 of this to be drawn down and applied for his dishonest purposes. Uh, basically, he wrote checks to himself. I mean, not quite, but yeah. Uh, people used checkbooks back in the day. Oh, and Claudia, I, I let it go the first time. <laughs> my car seems to be about my age. <laughs> yeah, I have checks. So um, even <laughs> people use checks, okay? That's a suspicious number of checkbooks, if I may say. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> probably because I don't actually use them, and so they just accumulate in the drawer. But uh, anyway, Claudia, I interrupted you, my love. So the uh, the chairman of a company had dishonestly uh, misappropriated company funds for his own purposes. Um, when the bank sued the company for the money back that they'd loaned, uh, the company and the guarantor counterclaimed, saying the bank shouldn't have paid out paid out the checks. Basically, uh, the case came before Mr. Justice Stone, who I think everyone can agree is awesome. And he said, well, basically it's a question as to on who, which innocent party should the loss fall. And a bank is under a duty to execute their customers' orders. That was uncontroversial. Where an account is a company account, the mandate will require the bank to carry out transactions at the behest of one or more authorized signatories. But very much unlike a personal bank account, the money is not the signatory's money, it's the company's money. And so being an authorised signatory gives one the chance to misappropriate company funds. I can ask a bank to pay all of my company's money to me, dissipate wildly, disappear to Aruba. Um, Quince Care said there is an implied duty of care in the customer-banker relationship. So if us open up, what does that actually mean? If the circumstances are such that they would raise questions in the mind of a reasonable bank as to whether the transaction was in fact truly authorised by the customer and was in fact for the customer's benefit, then they said the bank is on a duty of inquiry. If no inquiry is made, negligence is established and the damages for the loss suffered as a result. So Mr Justice Stone didn't go that far, but he, sa he said if the bank executes the order, knowing it to be dishonestly given, shutting its eyes to the obvious fact of the dishonesty, or acting recklessly in failing to make such inquiries as an honest or reasonable man would make, so the first three of these burden knowledge scales, then the bank will plainly be liable. Well, yeah, but that, yeah, yeah, it's the lesser state of knowledge, though, isn't it, that the case is all about? Uh, so well, I'm just looking at the critical question is, um, the critical question is what lesser state of knowledge on the part of the bank will oblige the bank to make inquiries in judging whether the lines be drawn? So it goes down from that, Yeah. So the bank's duty to exercise reasonable skill and care in carrying out the account holder's instructions. Yeah. One, which he says may require them not to carry out the instructions if they have this knowledge that the order is dishonestly given, right? So like less than knowledge, but the idea of an order bit dishonestly given is the notion that the transaction is not truly authorised by the account holder. The person giving the order is acting dishonestly. So if and for so long as the banker is put on inquiry in the sense that he has reasonable grounds, although not necessarily yeah. proof, for believing that the order is an attempt to misappropriate the funds of the company. But there he said they didn't. And that, you know, decades have gone by without the yeah, any bank ever having been found to be in breach of this duty. Claudia, what year was Quinn's care? Uh, Staying first instance, I guess, the 80s. It's, nine, it's 88 is the decision. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's right. I mean, the, I, the difference between, we'll come on to the controversy because we don't all agree about this, but I think one of the differences 
is that is Quince Care talking about this very general duty of care and then just giving one example, or is it a more narrow concept of a duty of care when the customer is being defrauded by a an agent? Um, so uh, after Quince Care, we have uh, well, act- actually before Quince Care, isn't it? It's Lipkin Gorman at first instance, and then Lipkin Gorman in the Court of Appeal, which is the case we all know because that's about. Restitution, Playboy Club. unjust enrichment. Sorry, but in the court you know it, of appeal, unjust enrichment, not because of the Playboy Club. You're right. Not the Playboy Club. <laughs> yeah, well, cut. Yeah, the cart nail is the anagram, isn't it, of Park Lane? It was the, as you say, it was the ex Playboy Club. Um, but it, so in Living Gorman Cart Nail, you've got this guy, this partner of a solicitor's firm called Mr. Cass, and he's stealing money from the bank account and gambling it away at the what was the Playboy Club, and most of it in cash, uh, over £200,000. I mean, this was back when £200,000 was a lot of money. And uh, one draft, one banker's draft he stole. And in the uh, the many defendants that the firm sued, uh, included in that was the bank, and they said the bank should have known. And the judge held that the bank was dishonest and had actual or sufficient knowledge to make them... Uh, culpable. In the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal said that judge shouldn't have found that because that wasn't really pleaded against them. And then the question was, were they negligent? And the Court of Appeal said, no, they weren't negligent. They didn't have sufficient to mount a a quince care duty. I mean, the other case one might mention and crops up in the Philip case that we'll look at in a moment is the tidal energy case. That wasn't a case about bankers' duties of care but it's an interesting case because it falls in this general fraud area. That was an invoice fraud. Uh, that's the one where you, uh, the fraudster contacts the company under the guise of being one of the company's suppliers and says, oh, we've changed. I mean, in that case, the fraudster phones up Tidal Energy on behalf of Darkrest and says, oh, we've changed our bank account details. Here's our new bank account details. So then Tidal Energy pays, again, £200,000 debt, they think they're paying their genuine supplier. In fact, they are paying the fraudster. And the issue in that case was if they fill in the chaps form that says, uh, pay, sorry, not dark risk, design craft, pay design craft, and then the bank account details and the sort code of the fraudster, has the bank complied with those payment instructions? Held 2-1 in the Court of Appeal, yes, they have. The, the name isn't the key point. The key point is sort code and account number. Yeah, but that's a sort of different thing, right? That is, have they executed the instruction properly, like you know, not transposing numbers, doing it to the right account number, whereas Quince Care is about yeah. more sort of avuncular, are you sure that you, the customer, really want this payment to be made at all and you're not being defrauded while you're making it, right? So You, the customer being the company, right? Because the company in Tidal Energy did want to make the payment, but only because they had been fraudulently induced to believe that they were making a payment to somebody who they owed money to. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't argued in time that it was a it was a negligence case. They weren't argued it was a duty of care case. They were because I think there case. wasn't one. But this is something we disagree on, and I'm sure we'll row about it. Oh, we'll come to that. Later. We'll come to that. I, I'm still hoping you'll come around to realise the truth. But Poonam, uh, Singularis. Now, this is another case about this general duty of care the banks owe to their customers, I think I'm right in saying. Right, so Singularis, uh, very recent, 2019, and Supreme Court unanimous uh, judgment uh, given by Lady Hale. The, The exciting thing about Singularis, there are many, is that as far as we've been able to work out, it is the only case where the quince care duty on a bank has led to the bank actually being found liable not just the duty being found to exist, but to find that there was a breach. Uh, And the facts are very um, extraordinary too. So there's this company, Singularis, that has seven different directors, but six of them do nothing. They're very reputable people, but it's just kind of a board of directors that do nothing. Mr. S uh, is the sole shareholder, the director and the chairman shareholder, director, chairman, and he's the one director of the seven who manages all the accounts and does everything. The others are just their name. And 
this company in some ways appears to be very profitable because there comes a point in time where they have 210 million US dollars in a deposit account with the bank, Daiwa. And Mr. S uh, gives instructions to the bank and he is the authorized person on behalf of the company Singularis to give instructions. He instructs the bank to transfer 204 million of the 210 to some different bank accounts. Five of them belong to a hospital and the others somewhere else. And the bank executes. And then the company Singularis, uh, who are now in liquidation, their liquidators sue the bank, alleging a quince care, duty of care, and saying you breached it by allowing these payments to be made. You should have stopped it. Now, the interesting thing is that... It was found at first instance and, and all the way through and it wasn't challenged in the Supreme Court that the bank had breached the duty because it had had red flags all over the place. It knew the company was in financial difficulty so should not be sending out 204 million of its money elsewhere. It actually knew something about the hospital thing being a scam. There were about eight things the judge at first instance found were all red flags that meant this bank was fully on inquiry, reckless, uh, and should have made some inquiries. The argument being you should have asked the other directors or whatever. Anyway, so, so how did it get to the Supreme Court? What the we... argument being you should have asked the other directors to find out if the payment was in fact authorised by the account holder, right? And well, like that, that was the duty. Quite. Right. Yeah. And what the, the, the technical, the arguments that it went to the Supreme Court about was what they said, hold on a minute, your own, the company's own director is the one who gave the instructions. He's the one who was doing all of this. He's the fraudster. His fraud should be attributed to the company. So it's the company's fraud and so you can't claim against us. And or the other way, but it was causation. We haven't caused your loss. Your own fraudsters caused the loss and all of this. So one of the big issues was attribution and when can you attribute a, a, a uh, uh, one direct one director's knowledge the others but lady hell said some important things along the way uh, they, they said that you couldn't attribute the knowledge and she said even if you could i'm not sure illegality and causation would work and um, just to give you some of the sound bites um in, in the context of causation they were saying you know it was his fault that caused it not the banks uh, and she quotes um lord hoffman uh, in a case called Reeves and the Commissioner of the Metropol Metropolis, apologies, uh, where Lord Hoffman says, look, it is really rare that you put a duty on uh, somebody to protect someone else from the harm they cause themselves. But it can happen. And Lady Hale describes the quince care duty as that sort of duty. She says, the purpose of the quince care duty is to protect a bank's customers from the harm caused by people for whom the customer is in one way or another responsible. Uh, the point there being, of course, the company Singularis is in one way or another responsible for its fraudulent shareholder director. But So there is this protective element to it. Um, and there was also this argument of attribution, as I said, she goes, but hold on a minute. This is a company we long understand the separate corporate personality between a company and its shareholders. Uh, and the fact that one director did this doesn't mean the company can't claim the loss as its separate legal personality. So that was 2019. Not difficult to see why the company, the, the, the bank lost, given all the red flags and, and the, the, the lords going out of their way or finding that they should be liable. And as I say, the only case, but then where do we go next, Joe? I think Claudia. Yeah, I mean, another case where it's not hard to see in this case why the bank wasn't liable, I would say. Uh, this is a case about whether or not the duty to refrain from acting on instructions is one which bites on a bank dealing with a natural person, one individual's account. So this account was held by Mrs. Philip and she and her husband had been duped by a fraudster. It was actually Dr. Philip who had been scammed originally. He held almost a million pounds of their money in an investment account. 
And he got a message to call someone at the HSBC fraud department. And so he called the number that he was given and spoke to a fraudster who he thought was HSBC. And the fraudster said that he was working for the FCA and that they were carrying out this top secret investigation in conjunction with the NCA and that they really needed Dr. Phillips's help. And he was like, don't alert HSBC to this. Don't speak to anyone else at the FCA. Don't speak to anyone else at the NCA. There are all kinds of people involved. There's this like really huge high level fraud. And you, Dr. Phillips, are the key to the whole thing. The only way we can catch these bad guys who go right to the top is if you pay £950,000 into this bank account in the UAE. And Dr. Phillips said, oh, God, OK, so uh, uh, sure. Um, so there were a number of facts that meant that the bank could say the claim would fail on grounds of causation anyway. Uh, but long story short, the Phillips fell for a fraudster. They paid, uh, and it was Mrs. Phillips who paid, Mr. Phillips transferred to his wife, uh, £700,000 to a bank account in the UAE because they thought that they were assisting the NCA and the FCA with a crime-busting investigation. Didn't the FCA say that that was to keep their money safe, and it was it was like an FCA-held account. The FCA said, yes, yeah, so this is a super safe FCA. Uh, this is super safe FCA account. What we need you to do is to pay this money. There's this company called Lamy Petroleum in the UAE. And the FCA said it's it's a safe, it's a super safe. Hold oh, on a minute. The FCA didn't say it. The frauds were pretending to be the FCA. Yes. Sorry, yes. The frauds just said you, we need to. Then the police so turned even, up and said, it, we think you've been defrauded. There's a super suspicious company called Lamy Petroleum. The real police or the frauds did pretending to be police? The real police. The real police okay. said there's this suspicious company called Lamy Petroleum in the UAE. They seem to have your bank accounts. We've closed your accounts or we've put a block on your account while we investigate what looks like a serious fraud on you. And they said, no, 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 don't block the accounts. Pay all the money to Lamy Petroleum. They wouldn't let the police into their house, would they? Yeah, it it, it is extraordinary. But that's so extreme. But the basic point is, because of a fraud on Mrs. Phillip, she said to the bank, please pay this money and urged them to pay this money when they said, hang on a minute, um, to pay this money to a third party. So the payment, so the money, the payment instruction was actually authorised by the account holder. The transfer was in accordance with the mandate, this overriding obligation, as Mr. Ju uh, Justice Sain said it. But Mrs. Phillips said, um, oh, you should pay me the money back uh, because you were under a duty not to pay the money or, in fact, actually to go and investigate and get the money back for me. Um, now, we've, got to, we've, got to sell it, we've got to separate two things here. I think we, we all agree. There are two points that were decided one was an argument that the quince care duty just simply isn't engaged where the customer is deceived into making, giving the instruction. And the other point is whether on the facts of this case, it was plausible that any negligence alleged could have uh, caused the loss. Right. So the, the point that we're really discussing is whether or not a duty on a bank to refrain from acting on instructions for long as they have reasonable grounds for believing that it might not be truly authorised by its customer can also apply to transactions which are truly authorised by their customer if their customer wouldn't have authorised that transaction if they'd known slightly more about it. Basically. And the distinction with quince care, just to be clear, is not, it's got nothing to do with complying with the mandate because the quince care duty is engaged if the bank complies with the mandate. The distinction is that in a quince care situation, you have an agent who is dishonest executing the instruction. So but in, in the, the quince care case, situation, you have, you have the principal who is deceived by the fraudster. Right. So the quince care duty is the quince care case. Sorry, I should say we're positive about the duty is about circumstances where the account holder may not have truly authorized the transaction. The request to the bank is itself the means of the signatory misappropriating money for himself, which isn't his, it's the company's. And the duty, I think we all agree that the duty, and I'm quoting now from paragraph one of Singularis, citing Quince Care, an implied term of the contract between a bank and a customer that the bank would use reasonable skill and care in and about executing the customer orders. I think we all agree that's the duty. What we don't agree about is what that means in the Philip situation. 
Joe, you're being very quiet today. Yeah, Joe, what do they actually decide and pull it? Well, uh, uh, the- let me just lay my car- cards on the table, then we'll go around, then we'll look at case study. I think the Philip decision is wrongly decided. Oh, we yeah, haven't told us you yet. Oh, yeah. we've got to look at the Philip decision. Well, yeah. you know, you t- yeah. tell us then what the outcome is. Yeah, Joe. All right, all right, I'm jumping ahead. Be quiet, okay. Paul. Joe, speak. So, uh, Paul's right. There were two, it was a summary judgment application made by the bank, and there were two grounds. The first was causation, and the second was this point about the scope of the duty. A summary judgment by the bank. The judgment by the bank. Strike up. Um, and, and the bank's case on causation was pretty simple. They said, doesn't didn't matter what we, we did. The, these people thought that anyone who was not the fraudster was in on the fraud. So even if we'd said you shouldn't make this payment, as the police were saying, you would have still made, told us to make the payment. But Mrs. Um, Phillips says you should have gone further and got it back. Yeah, well, yeah. But that, that we're not dealing with that duty, duty because, because that's anyway. the scope of this about when, I think only Paul would argue for the existence of that duty. But um, well, we'll see. The, the judge said, I mean, the judge expressed some, some, some sympathy for that argument, but said if it had just been that, he would have let it go to trial because it was an issue of fact. Um, but on the, the scope of the quince care duty or the scope of the duty point, he repeated Mr. Justice Elliott's decision in um, Lipkin Gorman at first instance. He said a bank is not uh, supposed to be an amateur detective. Uh, the duty only arises if the bank is put on inquiry and he accepted Barclay's argument that the duty is only engaged where the person giving the payment instruction is themselves involved in the fraud. So they are the ones or or party to seeking to defraud the, the principal, the account holder. It doesn't apply where the instruction is given by someone honestly and and they're not involved in any wrongdoing. It's just that they have been duped. So that was the the ratio of his decision on the scope of duty. So you owe the duty if your customer is a bank, is a, is a company, and has been a prat and has put too much trust in one agent that has a mandate. But you don't owe the duty if your customer is a person and has been a prat and been defrauded by someone else. Well, as a matter of fact, I think that's right. But I, I, I would suggest that's not really the right way of looking at it. The, the, way of, the right way of looking at it, it seems to me, is to say the bank has a duty to make sure that if, if they're on inquiry that the, a person giving them a payment instruction doesn't really have the authority to do it because they're doing it for an improper purpose. Yeah, exactly. It's about whether then, a transaction is in fact authorised. Yeah, then then they, they shouldn't make the, make the payment. What the bank doesn't have a duty to do is to check whether a payment instruction, which is properly given, is the subject of anterior fraud. Right, whether you, you say that what the that fraud fact, in the one case... You say fraud in one case taints the instruction to the bank because the bank's knowledge, but not in the other. But um, so, I mean, there's just cards on the table. Cards on, let's just go around. Okay, so I think Philip is wrongly decided. It's going to the Court of Appeal. The judge gave permission so that, that it will be looked at again. I think it's wrong, not on the plausibility. Uh, the facts are uh, very weak for the claimant, but just simply on the scope of duty. Uh, Claudia, what do you think about it? I think it's definitely right. It's definitely right. And Joe? Yeah, it's right. And then Poonam? Yeah, so um, I thought it was right because I don't like the idea of my bank stopping me from making payments and calling me up when I'm at shops and saying they've stopped my credit card. But on mature reflection and leaving aside my own spending habits... You think I'm the bank should have... I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong to just say there is no duty. It might be satisfied reasonably easily on certain facts, but I think it's wrong to say there's simply no duty. So let's have a look at the let's have a look at the case study. What is the duty? Well, the, the duty is to in the execution of in and about the words of uh, Baroness Hale in Singularis has a duty of reasonable skill and care in and about executing customers' orders. And the question is obviously what that duty requires in particular circumstances. And yeah. I think this is... It, so it's not It's not just... You can't just say, oh, there's this general duty. In, in particular circumstances, 
that duty requires a bank to check whether a payment instruction is in fact authorised, for example. It's you are saying that it, it goes further and the duty to take reasonable care requires the bank to check whether it would still be authorised. You're using this language, right? Of course. Uh, just, just be careful when you use the word authorised. When a bank gets a call, um, say, on, on you know, phone banking, um, and it's someone, a woman pretending to be me, the bank has to be careful that it is me and that the person with authority is the one they're speaking to, so it's authorised, and the bank has to do that. But the authority, but in all the cases, Quince Care, Singularis, whatever, vis-a-vis -vis the bank, the person who gave the instruction was authorised. They were the one with the mandate vis-a-vis -vis the bank. Yes, so but they are in right. They had to check that they were the person who had the mandate was actually authorised by the company behind them. So it is checking into something that's not really between the banks. You know, yeah, so, yeah, exactly. And that's the tension, right? So the person has authority to conduct transactions on the account. They can deal with the company's money. I'm, when I talk about whether a transaction is, quote unquote, truly authorised, I'm adopting the language of Quint's care and the decisions that have followed in which the judges talk about whether or not the company whose money it is and who is the bank's customer has truly authorised a particular dealing with the money, which is, I think, a different question from whether the... We need, we need to look at the, we need to look at the case study. We, yeah, need, we need to look at the case study, OK? So let's just put the case study up. So what we've got here is Mrs Bloom... Uh, runs a florist business as a sole trader. The business has banked with Bar West for 35 years. Last Tuesday, a fraudster persuaded Mrs. Bloom to telephone the bank manager, Mr. Sloppy, and transfer a million pounds to the account of Dark Matter Inc., held by the First Bank of Comoros. Mr. Sloppy was suspicious that Mrs. Bloom was being tricked and did a Google search, finding that Dark Matter was being investigated by the FBI, uh, the NCA, and the RSPCA for fraud. Uh, Mr. Sloppy meant to stop the payment, but forgot. So he's clearly negligent. Would Bar West be liable for Mrs. Bloom's loss? Puna. Well, Holly, you don't be negligent if you have a GC. Um, no, yeah. no, no, you can be careless. Clearly careless. <laughs> careless. careless, which is a very different thing from negligent. Um, well, let's not, let's not get into that. On the basis of the, the decision of Phillips that we've been discussing there would be no duty of care at common law, whether there was some regulatory or contractual duty, leave that aside. Uh, so there would not be liability as the law is currently understood. Uh, I think there should be. So uh, because I think the protection element, if the bank is on inquiry, a bank is in a superior position, it has not, there, not so, because he actually did a Google search, but in other circumstances, the bank might actually know that dark matter is a baddie company that's been perpetrating for us because they're, yeah, they deal with so many transactions. Uh, so anyway, my answer is yes, the bank should be liable. Okay, so I say plainly, I'd say is liable because I say the duty is an implied duty of care, contractual duty, in and about executing payment instructions, bank's negligent, that's, that's it. Joe, you say no duty. Well, I say, I mean, there might be a contractual duty or, or a FISMA duty, and, and there might be another liability if, if the bank actually knows, like, like, like they were thinking about in Lipkin Gorman. But no, I say no duty, no, like, quince care negligence duty uh, breached, yeah. Yeah, rather than say just And Claudia, so let me ask you this. Do you, do you accept that the bank has an implied duty under the Supply and Goods and Services Act to do whatever it does for the customer with reasonable care. Yeah, but some... I think the bank's duty to take reasonable care is something wholly different from a, the sort of duty that would require a bank to refrain from carrying out transactions which have been actually authorised by the customer because they are put on inquiry as to circumstances which might prompt the customer not to have authorised the transaction if they had known. Is the bank and manager that last here... Is, Unam is saying she doesn't think exists now, but she thinks it should exist, right? Is, is the bank manager here careless in carrying out the services for the customer? 
No. No, his carry, he carried out in accordance with his mandate. I mean, the, the, his actual, if he does have the sort of, I'm not disagreeing with Joe's analysis and the potential disorder. Clearly careless, clearly negligent. Careless. Careless, but not, not in, a, in and about the service that he's got. Well, you, uh, so then, then, then you win, don't you? You win. If, if you're, you're probably careless when I call you up asking for advice off the cuff all the time, Paul, but I don't get to see you. We're all, I don't mean to be careless, but, you know, we're all careless sometimes, but that's different from whether there should be a duty of accountability for that carelessness. If, he's, I if he has a... Argument, but, He's only, he's only negligent if he has a duty to refrain from carrying out the transaction. And when I am saying, oh, that phone call. he is under a duty to refrain from carrying out the transaction because he doesn't have, to, uh, he's not under a duty to investigate his customer's authorised transactions. In, to see in, actually, that, is that how the customer should be spending their money? In receiving the payment, uh, the payment instructions from the point, from that point in time to the point at which it goes through, is, is he involved in executing the customer's payment instructions. Yes, and he does that with reasonable scale. So he must have a duty on Quint's care. He must have a duty of care in that process. Not just on Quint's care. I think he is under but I think he complies with that duty by doing so what if he, he was falls told to below do. the standard of a reasonable banker in that situation. No, no, that's no he doesn't. Right. He does exactly what he was instructed to do, Paul. Okay, I'm really stressed because this is like the first time I've ever agreed with Paul against the two of you. It's normally this is, a, and I don't think this. Comes See, I don't think you do agree with Paul Pinan, though. I think you are saying. Oh my God! Now you're telling me I don't know under what I'm a different okay. duty, which is a. You are saying that the imbalance that you're talking about and the the way that fraudsters work today is such that the bank should be under a duty to refrain from carrying out particular transactions where they are on notice that that transaction would not have been authorized, and. It would not have been authorised, not because, for example, it was ill-advised, like, I don't think you should buy that dress, Poonam, it just does not look good, would not have been authorised because they were prompted by fraud. You're not wearing the dress, so that wasn't... <laughs> Sorry, that's under really personal. But that's... I think Paul is effectively saying there was a duty, in effect, to advise and say, actually... No, I'm sorry, I'm saying there's a duty of care in doing what the bank contractually has agreed to do. And part of what the bank has contractually agreed to do is execute payment instructions. OK, wait, wait, wait. Because what I want to say was our viewers, can you, because I'm so stressed about being alone with Paul on this, if you could quickly just say... Um, the oldies or the youngies or whatever phrase you want to do quickly and we'll see if Emily can collate it while we finish this up and talk about because I'm just curious because I'm nervous. Wait, so Poonam, do you think that he failed to exercise reasonable care in carrying out his payment instruction or do you think he's liable because he was under a different kind of duty? Which is a fraud prevention duty. I don't shy from saying banks have got a duty in this day and age to protect customers from their own... Folly because these confidence frauds are still in care, Paul. That's all. That's the, my point. These confidence frauds are are very common. Banks are assuming a duty. Uh, they do take steps, and I think that it's yeah. only a matter of time before the courts recognise that and if hold them to account. In about, that's not about, about, that's a you say in a, yeah, but I think that should be the law now, and I agree with Paul that in and about instructions. In the old days, you'd have just seen as, have you got the right account number, the right whatever? We already know it's more than that. It involves the, the, the checking that you really meant to do this, you, the customer. Just ask, I'll, I'll ask one question, okay? Um, I, know, I'm, I know what you're all say, but I asked throw this out just for viewers to think about. So um, should the bank set up its systems in such a way to identify potential fraud or, or protect customers from fraud. So one example is many banks have a cooling off period if you set up a new uh, payee, so you can't send a large payment for 30 minutes. Now, sh sh should the banks have a duty of care in that regard? Not so much in receiving, asking, advising, but simply in the way that they construct their systems. Well, Joe says no. No, I, I think that's fine. F fine for them to do that. Why not? But Paul, it's all very good. Then are they going to call you in that 30 minutes to check? I mean, mine has a new thing now. If it's a new beneficiary going, stop. Are you sure? Are you sure this isn't just scam? Yeah, yeah. But I just think, no one calls me to check. What's your point? You think they should, 30 minutes is neither here nor there. I'll get my, my cup of tea. And do you say, Poonam, no, I want that dress now, not in 30 minutes, now. 
It's close. Anyway, look, but, I think. But, right, but what if you do? Because it's you make the you try to make a purchase, for example, at five to five, and it's not a dress. You're trying to buy a property or something that someone else will buy tomorrow. That could happen, and if it doesn't go through because you left it to the last minute, you might you might get zumped. Can you imagine? Right. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna call it a day there because we're never gonna agree on this. We'll have to wait and see what the court of appeals say. Um, do send in your comments, and we will report on the result of any um, uh, vote straw poll next week. So that just leaves us to uh, talk about next week uh, when we are looking at. Somebody remind me. Bribery. Bribery, yes. I knew, I knew all of that. I was just testing. Uh, we're looking at bribery and recent decisions, uh, first instance decision in King's uh, Security Systems Limited. And uh, that will be the last episode of this series of quadcasts. That leaves it just for me to say thank you very much to the Quadcast team. Thank you to Emily Saunderson, our long-suffering producer. Thank you to Ben Jacobs, Fisheye Productions, for doing the live streaming. With that, I say good night, everybody.